It's already been done on the cross. Amen. It's already been done on the cross. I said it's already been done on the cross. Yes. Give somebody a high five and take a seat. God bless you all. Thank you. Come on out. Great job, worship team. Great job, Brene. Great job, Jack. Jack, Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you guys excited for the word today? All right. Because I'm, I'm here to give you a word that's going to change your life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 through 11. Let's get into it. The Holy Spirit's here. He's just waiting for the word to be spoken. Do you understand that? When the Holy Spirit is present and the word is present, you have all the potential power of the Godhead at your disposal. Let me prove that to you. Genesis 1 says what? In the beginning, God. Genesis 1, 2. And the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters and he was waiting for something. He was waiting for the word of God to be spoken. Out of God being present, the word and the Holy Spirit, he created the water, he created the mountains, he created the stars, he created the universe, he created the animals, he created the trees. Two ingredients, the word, the Holy Spirit. When the word of God and the Holy Spirit are both present, all of the potential creative power of the Godhead is available at your disposal. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 through 11. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Somebody say amen. amen. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. We'll talk about that in a moment. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, that means your time here on earth, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You're not going to be judged for what you do after your time on earth. You're not judged for what you did before your time on earth. You're judged for what you're doing right now is what you're going to be accountable to at the judgment seat. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. The terror of the Lord. Another translation, the fear of God. We persuade men. So what's going to happen at this judgment seat is so serious. Paul got a revelation of it, and he says, now that I know what's going to happen and what we're going to be judged for, this is not something small. This is something serious. This is everything. This is, this is whether God's going to say, well done, or he's not. This is whether I'm going to show up and God's going to be pleased with what I did or he's going to have to throw everything I did into the fire. He said, this is serious, so serious that I got the fear of God on this. I have a reverence. I have an honor for the Lord so much that I got to tell other people about this and I got to tell them how to do it right so that when you show up to the judgment seat, you're not going to be one of those people who are left wanting, who sat in church your whole life, yet Jesus says, depart from me. You didn't even do what I wanted. You're not going to be one of those people who lived your life, who God had a purpose for you. Paul says, I'm not going to let this happen. I got to tell you about this because you will give an account. You can't just do whatever you want to do and then just God forgives you. You can't just say, you can't just say God's grace covers me. You can't just read did that excuse isn't going to last anymore. When you get to the judgment seat, this is serious. But we all know, we all are well known to God. And I also trust that well known in your consciences. So, but Paul says for us, God knows me. And I know God. Let's read that same verse in one other translation. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then, I love that moment then, the word then means in that moment, we will be at home with the Lord. Do you know as a believer, the moment you die, you don't like have to wait. That moment you open up your eyes in front of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's why Paul's like, there's one point where Paul talks about it. He says, you know, it's, I'm kind of considering something right now. Paul's having a debate with himself. And he says, I'm kind of wondering whether I just let myself go now because I, I want to be with Jesus, man. But he said, it's for your benefit, more of your benefit that I would stay here. 
So Paul actually was so, listen to this, Paul realized that death was not something that had a hold over him. So he said, I can let my spirit go whenever I want, but I'm going to stay here for your benefit, not because I want to. So in other words, I can say I want to go now, or I can say here. Death was something, he's like, I can pull that thing around wherever I want. I release my spirit when I say. There ain't no devil taking my life out. There's no demons taking my life out. You're not going to decide. You're not going to decide. God and I, we got this. And I know that when my race is over, that's when I go up. Not a moment before my race is over. Not a day before. For we are confident we'd rather be out of these earthly bodies. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please God. My goal, your goal, is not to become famous on Instagram. Your goal is not to become a multimillionaire so you can look at all the people that gossiped about you and say, look at me now. That's not your goal. Your goal is not to have a hundred businesses so that you can be arrogant and prideful and say you did it. Your goal is not to have a bigger church than their church just so you can say you have more people than they have. Your goal is not to go about life showing yourself and trying to build your kingdom. Your goal is to build the kingdom of God. Your goal is to be pleasing to God. My dad said this for years. I love this. I always take it from him. He says, the greatest pillow to sleep on is a clean conscience. Between you and God, when you go to sleep at night, do you feel God's pleasure and smile with your life? Or do you not? Do you feel like where you're at in your life right now, you have a peace of God that's in you because you know you are being well-pleasing to him? You see, when you have the peace of God because you know you've been pleasing to him, you're not tormented by the enemy. You don't have anxiety attacks. You're not full of fear because there's a deeper peace than one that man can give you. It's a peace that what I'm doing with my life is pleasing to God. I obeyed God today. I obeyed what he told me to do. I forgave when he told me to forgive. I overcame because he told me I could. I was led. I spoke to that person because he told me to speak to him. I'm led by the spirit of God. Therefore, I have a clean conscience. What is your goal? What is your goal in life? Because your goal should be to be pleasing to God, period. That's it. Ambition has no place in Christianity. Ambition has no place in Christianity. What's ambition? Ambition is, I have this drive to be something great. I have this drive to do this. I have this drive to make my kingdom here. I have this drive. I have my own plans. Your plans don't belong in Christianity. Your kingdom cannot be set up and expect God's kingdom to be built next to it. He doesn't share thrones. When you become a Christian, you surrender all of your dreams. You surrender all of your ideas. You surrender your schedule and you say, God, I want your dreams, your ideas, your schedule. You see, God doesn't back up your dreams. He backs you up when you're doing his dreams. Some of y'all are wondering where God's been. Why doesn't he help me? You have favor? Why? Look at Gavin. Look at all these. They got all their favor on their life. I never have favor. God never helps me. It's because you're still doing your own dream. You got to find out God's dream. God will always pay for his ideas. You hear what I just said? God himself pays for his own ideas. But your idea, you're going to have to be left to pay for it. You're going to work. You're going to slave for it. You're going to sweat for it. There's nothing wrong with work, but when you're working with Jesus, it's, a, it's like favor is with you everywhere you go. There's a flow. There's a push behind it. There's a breeze. You see, people start businesses that God never told them to start, and be, they wonder why God isn't helping them in the midst of it. He never told it, but they want to give them ownership. God, I'm tired. I'm doing these things, but God, why aren't you showing up? You're not fair. No, God's fair. It's just these people ask God what he wanted them to do, and because they're doing what he said, he's backing them up. You're doing your own idea. Don't blame God when it doesn't work. Just get in line. Get in line with what he's doing. Galatians 5, get in step with the Holy Ghost. 
There's already a river flowing. Did you know it? There's a river flowing that has its own force behind it. It's got its own power behind it. Nothing will stop up this river. It's called the river of the flow of God. It's the favor of God. There's a river that flows. If you get in the river, you simply get caught by the river. You are just on your way, but you're trying to create your own momentum because you're in your own river. You're paddling upstream constantly in your life, paddling upstream with your marriage, paddling upstream with the thing. But because you haven't surrendered the boat to the Holy Ghost, he can't lead you to the stream. So you get worn out. We have this thing in Christianity we call burnout. There's no such thing as burnout when you're led by the Holy Ghost. There is no such thing. I'm tired of hearing about this burnout thing. Do you know Paul would preach three to five times a day? And in between every time he'd preach, he'd be traveling on horseback, sometimes 20 to 30 miles. Sometimes he'd be walking for days and he would have energy and power. He'd get beaten with rods, but he'd still have energy and power. Why? Because there's a supernatural force that comes behind you when you're in the flow of the spirit. You don't get burned out. What are you talking about? God just simply increases your tent. He increases your capacity because every new thing God wants you to do, he backs you up. He gives you the power to do it. You're not on your own. So listen, he says, understanding my fearful responsibility, we work hard to persuade others. You see, there's work in the kingdom. See, do you know that before Adam and Eve sinned, Adam had a job? What does that mean? That means that jobs are not a, a, a consequence of the fall. Work is godly. It's not a consequence of the fall. It's not because of sin that we have to work. Adam already had a job. He was tending the field. He was naming animals. He had something to proclaim. He had something to do. He had a purpose before he ever met his wife. Listen, single people. You can't wait to meet your spouse to get a purpose. You better have a purpose so they can attach to it. What are you doing? Woman, what are you doing? You think you got to get a purpose from a man? You better have a purpose. Part of the curse, part of the curse when Adam and Eve sinned was that, and this is, this, this is a bonus, this isn't part, I just got to say that, part of the curse was that woman would have two things that happened to her, pain and childbirth, which supernaturally, I've seen women have childbirth without any pain because that's part of the curse. Number two is that their desire would be for the man. Their approval would have to come from men. Their desire would have to be connected to man. You always need a man to approve you. You always need a man to do it or you don't have an identity. That's part of the curse. You need to get set free. There is a man, his name is Jesus, and you need to get identity from him. You need to get approval from him. You see, one of the greatest insights, once again, this isn't a marriage ceremony, but I'm going to talk to couples right now. One of the greatest insights you can get to have the greatest marriages in the world is make Jesus the person you get your happiness from, not your husband or your wife. Stop putting your husband in a place of false expectation. It's not his job to make you happy. Stop putting your wife in a place of false expectation. It's not her job to meet your needs. God meets every single need. But we got a culture that says, Jerry Maguire, you complete me. And we're like, oh, it's so beautiful. And it's idolatry. Just idolatry. He doesn't complete you. You're already complete in Jesus. You got it. So Paul says, we're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ. Every single one of us. And listen to Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book, all the days of my life were already written in it. Before I even lived one of them. You see, we're going to get to the judgment seat, and God is going to present his book. It's not just the book of life, the one where your name's either in it or not. He's going to present a book of your life. 
And that book is going to have the things he purposed for you to do, the anointings he wanted for you, the plan he wanted for your family, the jobs he wanted you to do while you were here on earth, the ministries you were supposed to have, the people you were supposed to get saved, all those things. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 that many of us are going to show up to the judgment seat and we're going to come with our own book. Well, God, I was a pastor of 10 different churches. I never called for you to be a pastor. I wanted you to be a businessman. Well, God, I, I was a businessman and I had these millions of dollars. I never wanted you to be a businessman. I wanted you to be a missionary in Uganda. Well, God, I, I, I well, God... And exactly how quiet it is in this room is how it's going to be at the judgment seat when people are shocked because the book they bring does not match his book. And it's all because of one reason. You didn't know how to be led by the Holy Ghost. God has given us a guide here on earth. His name is the Holy Spirit. Now, please get this picture. Before time ever began, there was God. Before time began, there was God. God the Father was there, God the Son was there, and God the Holy Ghost. God the Father began to write this book that we just read about in Psalm 139. He began to write it about Will's life, and he said, Will's going to be this. Will's going to marry this person. Will's going to have this life. Will's going to do this with his ministry. Will's going to be this way. And he wrote all these things down before Will was ever even born. But over the shoulder of the Father, the Holy Ghost was looking over the shoulder of the Father as the Father was writing the plan. And the Holy Ghost was looking at the plan as it was been written. And that's why he, at that moment, decided, I'll never say anything that's not according to that plan. I'll never lead them that's not according to that plan. I'll never do anything that's opposite of that plan. But he was there the moment the plan was written. So here's what we do in life as Christians. We have two options. The Bible calls one the law. The law of Moses. It's what you can do in your own strength. It's what you can do with your own decisions. It's you trying to make yourself holy. It's you trying to please God without his help. That's the law. It's called the map. We have a map. We all have to take a journey through life to get to the judgment seat, and we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So we all have a journey. And it's going to be according to that book. So God gives us an option. He says you can take the map, which is you trying to figure this out, or you could take the person called the Holy Ghost who is the guide. So what we do is we get saved. And of course the Holy Spirit saved us. So we're grateful. So we're like, oh, thank you, Lord. But six months into it, we start being like, you know what? I think I got this thing. You know, I've been a holy warriors. You know? I come to some worship nights. You know what I mean? I've been to adopt the block. Somebody got saved. I just saved them last week. Woo! I feel like a Christian right now. I'm feeling good. I'm in my DG. I haven't missed a week in the last six months. Woo! I did the 30-day growth challenge. Bam, nailed it. I didn't even need coffee. Uh-huh. So we start getting there. We say, give me that map. I think I got this. All of a sudden, you get married. You start getting challenges. Two months into it, you're in a dark place. It's raining. It's deep. It's, it's thundering and lightning, and you're about to fall off a cliff, and you don't know where you're at. You've lost your way. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost comes, and he goes... Can I help you? God, oh my gosh, yes, please. I need you, Lord God, help me, help me. And all of a sudden you go to marriage challenge or you go to marriage advance and God comes in, boom, and he wrecks your life and blam, and our marriage is rescued and boom, we were about to get divorced, but we're all better now, whoa. But then six months later, you go back, you're like, you know, I think we got this. I, I was probably overreacting. It wasn't as bad as we thought. So you get the map again. Four months later, you're back strung out on something you used to do before you got saved. Because you lost again. The Holy Spirit, because he's merciful, comes and he says, uh, can I help you? Yes, God, oh, please come. And this is the story of our Christian life. We're constantly taking it back and then giving it because he needs to rescue us. We're constantly taking it back and then giving it because we're in an emergency. You're constantly taking it back and then we're giving it. When are you finally going to surrender your life to the guide called the Holy Ghost? Just surrender it once and for all. We have a guide. He knows the map. He was there when it was written. Are you going to choose the guide? Or are you going to choose your own plan? Ephesians 2.10, listen to this. We are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works. He created you for good things. Did you know that he didn't create you to kill people? He didn't create you to be in that gang. He didn't create you to be that person that you hate. He didn't create you to fail. He didn't create you to be a loser. He created you for good works. He created you to win. He created you to be a champion. He created you which God prepared beforehand. Watch these words. That we should walk in them. Ephesians 1, a chapter right before this, had talked about that we are all predestined. Now, Calvinists will take that and they'll be like, well, that means everything that happened was already predestined. That's not what that means. It means God has given every one of us a destiny before we were born. But you still have the choice whether you choose that destiny or you choose your own. It said we should walk in the good works God prepared. That means we have a choice whether we will or not. The Holy Spirit is a guide who wants to do it. Do you want to know about the Holy Ghost? Do you want to know how he leads you? Because this is going to determine whether you hear well done, good and faithful servant. The times that we're living in right now, y'all, over 2,500 prophecies in the Bible, at 2,500 prophecies, once they are fulfilled, Jesus will return. There's almost 2,100 already fulfilled. And I just got to tell you this. In the last 15 to 20 years, the momentum and the rate of how these prophecies are being fulfilled have compounded. Tenfold, sometimes 20 fold. I'm talking if you want a hundred years ago, you'd see a prophecy of prophecy. But ever since Israel became a nation, from that point, it's been like unfolded prophecy. Pop, 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 pop. The, the, the rate has sped up. The clock is speeding up. Jesus is coming back and you're going to have to give an account. And the only guide you have is the Holy Ghost. You got to know how he leads you. Number one. The Holy Ghost never demands anything from you. He waits for you to surrender it willingly. You know the Holy Ghost is the only owner who doesn't demand what he owns? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, your body doesn't even belong to you. It's actually not yours. Yet we eat whatever we want. We do whatever we want. We sleep as much as we want. We do whatever we want with these hands. We go wherever we want with these feet. We haven't surrendered. But see, he's not going to burst in and take your body from you. Romans 12, 1. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. You got to willingly give him your body so he can use you. Well, God never uses me. I'm here. He never uses me. You haven't surrendered your body to be used. Have you given these hands to God? Have you given these feet to God? Have you given that mouth to God? Have you said, cleanse my mouth? I'm not going to be a gossiper anymore. Have you said, cleanse my mouth? I don't want to lie anymore. God, touch my mouth with a hot coal. Make this a mouth of life. You got to surrender it to the Lord. How about your struggles so you can get a breakthrough? Some of y'all got struggles. Well, God doesn't see me. Why didn't he just take my struggles away? Doesn't he see how hard this is for me? He's not going to burst in and take it from me. You. you have to offer it to him willingly. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil. But give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have life. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. But he's not going to get there and stop you from sinning with your body. He wants you to willingly give it to him. Offer yourself completely to God. Your struggle, you got to give him your struggle if you want him to give you a breakthrough. Your burdens, how about those? You're carrying your burdens around, but God wants those from you. He wants your burden so he can sustain you, but he's not going to take it from you. You have to give it. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden upon the Lord, releasing the weight of it. And he will sustain you, uphold you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken, slip, or fall. So he can't take your burden away from you. He waits for you to get in his presence, hit your knees, and say, God, I can't handle this. I need you to take it. You got to surrender it to him. How about your anxieties and worries so he can give you peace? Some of y'all cannot sleep because you still have anxiety attacks. But God is not going to come in and give you a great sleep until you recognize you need his help. You have to ask him. That, listen to this. This is uh, Philippians 4. Do not be anxious or worried about anything. But in everything, in every circumstance, by prayer 
and petition with thanksgiving continue to make your requests known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding reassures your heart that peace which transcends all understanding that peace which stands guard over your hearts and mind is yours in Jesus you got to give your anxiety to God he's not going to take it from you he doesn't take he waits till it's given willingly I never hear God's voice. I don't know. He doesn't direct me. I'm so confused. I don't know where to go. How come God never directs me? I need direction. I need direction. Well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own insight and understanding. Listen, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Recognize him, and he will make your path straight. The reason why you don't have direction is because you don't stop, pause, and ask his opinion. You got to offer your life to God. Do you know he owns it anyway? Do you know it's his? The Bible says Jesus redeemed you by the blood. If he redeemed you, it means he bought you. You actually don't belong to yourself. The Bible says in Haggai, all the silver and gold is the Lord. That means your money doesn't belong to you. You don't have a right to withhold it. It's not yours. Your children don't belong to you. You don't have a right to speak to them however you want. They're not yours. Your husband and wife is not your husband and wife first. That's a daughter of God before she's your wife. That's a son of God before it's your husband. That's why you can't treat them however you want to. The Bible says in Peter, for husbands, he says, husband, if you don't dwell with understanding with your wife, he said, I won't hear your prayers. Because she's not yours first. I understand she's got a ring on her finger, but that's for everybody else. She's mine. That's my daughter. You got to ask me. You got to, how do I treat her? How do I understand her? How do I, I'm going to need help from you, God. You got to get on your knees. You got to be led in marriage. You got to be led being a parent. You got to be led being a teacher. You got to be led on your job. You got to be led as a boss. You need the help of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will never compete with the other voices or distractions in your life. He simply waits for you to turn them down. He waits for you to turn them down. He will not compete with your Netflix shows. He's not going to compete with The Bachelorette. He's not going <laughs> to... He's not going to compete with your sports. You're in church right now and you're checking the scores of the games. You're under the word of God and you are literally being so disrespectful to his spirit. Why would he move in your life? It's not disrespectful to Gavin. This is God's word. We worship our sports and our games, but he won't share that. He simply waits for you to turn them down. I'm not saying sports are wrong. I'm not saying don't enjoy things. I'm saying you better know where you're at and the time that you're at. And if the Holy Spirit is wanting more time with you, nothing else is more important than that. Number two. It's how the Holy Ghost leads you. So first of all, he's waiting for you to offer it to him. Number two, he's a person. He's waiting. How much you can be led is determined by how much of the word is already in you or not in you. How much you are able to be led is determined by how much of the word is already in you or not in you. Why? Let me tell you John 14, 26. Jesus is speaking. The comforter, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will cause you to recall, remind you of, or bring to your remembrance everything I have told you. He'll cause you to remember, remind you of, or recall. Now, you got to understand, this is Jesus speaking. So Jesus had been speaking to them. So Jesus is saying the Holy Ghost is going to come and remind you of what I spoke to you the last three years. But Jesus is the word made flesh. John 1.1. 1, 1. 
in the beginning was the Word. It already existed. The Word was God. The Word was with God. John 1, 14. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father and his only Son. So the Bible that we have grew bones grew a hand, grew blood vessels, grew eyes, grew a brain. Colossians became legs. Ephesians became some toes. Psalms was a heart that beat all of a sudden. So when he sat down, it was a sermon. When he stood up, it was a sermon. When he walked, it was a sermon. When he kept his hands off, it was a sermon. When he put his hands on, it was a sermon. Every time you saw him, you flipped a page. If you opened your eyes, you might have saw Colossians when he laid hands. You might have seen Psalms when he began to teach. You might have seen the prophets when he began to declare toward the, toward the Pharisees. You, might, you were watching the pages flip. He was God's mobile hospital. He was a hospital on wheels. He was the word of God. So no, you and I don't have him in the flesh, but we have him in the word. So how can the Holy Ghost remind you of something that's not already in you? John 15, 2 through 3, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes. Prunes. To prune means to cut. He cuts you. So let me tell you something. If you're doing something right and God blesses you, he rewards you by cutting you. You get rewarded for bearing fruit with more cuts. Because he loves fruit bearing, but he wants more fruit. He loves your success, but he wants to give you more success. He's obsessed with results. You see, we in the church, we think that revival is people coming down here, jumping up and down, and having an extended singing service for two or three hours. You can sing for two or three hours and then go cuss your husband out right afterwards. Is that really revival? Oh, man, our house is packed. Okay, I'm glad people are coming. Praise the Lord. But did any of those people submit to the, the authority of the Holy Spirit? Or did they come down here and do an emotional exercise and go home the same? That's not revival. Jesus says in the word, he says, I want to see justice flow like a river. He says, I want to see the orphan and the widow rescued. I want the orphan to be put in family. I want the poor to be fed. I want the sick to be healed. I want the destitute to have a new life. The anointing that I gave you breaks the yoke. I didn't give you an anointing so you could act like you're better. I want you to actually be better. The blood of Jesus was not there just to heal you from the consequences of sin. The blood of Jesus gives you power over the power of sin. You see, a lot of Christians, they hate the consequences of sin, and that's why they keep saying they're sorry, because they don't want to feel guilty and they don't want to feel ashamed, but they also don't want to change. But you're short-circuiting. The cross was not there just to heal you from the consequence of sin. The cross is there. He gives you power not to do the sin ever again. So we're here with the Holy Ghost. Imagine going to the doctor's office, okay? And you need a root canal. Anybody ever had a root canal? Oh, dear God. God bless y'all. I had to watch my mom do that when I was a kid. That was an ugly thing. I felt so bad for her. It was like a drill. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like <laughs> drilling in her mouth. I mean, it was serious. So imagine going to the doctor. You're waiting in the waiting room. You get into the chair, and he's got to do a root canal on you. But wait. The only tools he has is this. This is going to be a bad surgery. Or how about this? How about these? How about this? This is what it happens when we come to the Holy Ghost. Listen, he's the greatest doctor ever. He knows how to fix everything. I'm telling you, every problem you've ever had, he has the answer. He knows the antidote. He's got the medicine. He knows the solution. But watch this. 
We get to the doctor's office and he doesn't have the tools because we didn't equip him pre-prepared the tools. So when he gets there, he can't do the job. You don't wait till you're in a crisis to get full of the word. You need to get full of the word right now because when you get to the crisis, you'll go through it smoothly because you've already pre-prepared the tools. You don't wait till you get in a battle to get in the word. You better get in the word now because when you get in the battle, you'll be looking and you'll have no sword to fight with. Ephesians 6 says it's the Holy Ghost sword. The word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing between joint and marrow and soul and spirit. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You guys thought that the word of God was just for demons? You're wrong. 95% of the time, the cutting's going to be to you. He takes the sword and he cuts you to make you like Jesus. The number one tool the Holy Ghost is looking for, what he's looking for in your life right now, is he's looking for a word to attach to. He's looking for a tool. He sees your depression. He sees your sickness. He sees your loneliness. But if you don't give him the tool, he can't do the job. He's waiting for you to prepare the tool so he can use it to heal you. Genesis 1, 2 through 3. The earth was formless and void. Empty and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, the Holy Spirit is waiting. You see, your chaos attracts the Holy Ghost. It doesn't repel him. Your confusion, you might think he's far. He's actually closer than he's ever been. When you feel more destitute than you've ever been, the Holy Spirit is closer than he's ever been. When you feel more alone than you've ever been, the Holy Spirit's closer than he's ever been. But he's not acting because he's waiting for something. He's hovering. He's waiting for a word to come out of your mouth. He's waiting for a promise to be found in your heart. You see, y'all? The Holy Spirit, even though he sees your tears and he cares for them, Psalm 56, 8 says, he holds your tears in a bottle and he looks at them throughout the day. God does care, but he can't move on tears. He cannot bring Lazarus out of the tomb because you were crying about him. Do you notice how they were crying, but nobody got Lazarus up out of that tomb until the word walked onto the scene? Do you see that? The word had to walk onto the scene. And even though Jesus was weeping as well, for it said Jesus wept, in weeping the word spoke. You see, you can be crying, you can be destitute, but if you got a word inside, God will move. He's looking for the word. You want to know how the Holy Ghost moves? You want to hear well done, good and faithful servant? You want to go up to the judgment seat? You better know how to be led. He leads as he waits for you to offer it to him. He won't take it. And he's looking for a word to connect to. If he gets into your life and he doesn't see the word, remember, the last place you progressed in Christianity was the last place you submitted. The last moment you submitted, it could have been three years ago, it could have been five years ago, that's where you're parked until the next time you submit. You could be in this church for 30 years and still be in the same place spiritually than when you began because you have not submitted to the leadership of the Holy Ghost in 30 years. You only progress the moments you submit. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is here, y'all. He's the guide. He wants to help you. You got to pre-prepare him. Last two things and we're going to pray. Three, he leads one step at a time. One step at a time. You see, your destiny is not going to be given to you overnight. Many of y'all are frustrated. I don't know what I'm supposed to be. I don't know if I'm an evangelist. I don't know if I'm a pastor. I don't know if I'm a businessman. I still just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's because you don't understand how the Holy Spirit moves. He never tells you everything. He tells you the next step. Do you know the last thing he told you to do? Here's my question. Have you obeyed it? It might have been seven years ago when he told you to call your mama and ask for forgiveness. But if you didn't do it, you're still seven years ago in the Holy Ghost mind. I've had people literally come to me and they are trying to escape the, the correction of the Holy Ghost that they say, we have to move. God's calling us to another state. He's calling us. We really feel that our time here is lifted. Our season here is done. God's calling us to another country. And they think in their mind that if they move states or they move countries, God's just going to forget about what he was trying to teach them and they're going to start over. 
You'll just go to that country and learn the same lesson. You'll go to that job and learn that same lesson. You'll go, because here's the deal, until you obey the last thing the Holy Ghost said, you can't get the next thing. But he makes it easy for you. He just tells you one step. He's speaking to you one step. Stop putting so much pressure on yourself to know your entire calling. It's not how he works. He's wanting you to obey the next step. He'll give you a glimpse like he did Abraham. Abraham, look at the stars. You're going to be a father. But he didn't know how he was going to get there. He'll give you a glimpse. But then he's going to lead you step by step. Acts chapter 8, 26 and 29. Philip is in a cave. And it says, the angel of the Lord said to him, go down south to the road, which leads to Gaza. He gives him an instruction. I want you to go on the road. Watch verse 29. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk alongside the carriage. So you got to understand he's in a cave. He hears go to a road. He doesn't know anything else. Okay? Then he's on the road and he hears God say, because an Ethiopian eunuch is on his carriage, he hears the Holy Ghost say, go up to the carriage. Now, this is what you and I would have wanted God to say. This is the way we want God to speak. I want you to go out on the road. You're going to find a man there who's in a carriage. He's going to be walking by. You're going to walk up to him. He's going to happen to be reading the scriptures, and you're going to be able to explain it to him. He's going to invite you into the carriage. Then it's going to be so cool. He, then you're going to baptize this guy in water. After you baptize him in water, I'm going to translate you 55 miles away to the city of Azotos. It's going to be an incredible day. Are you ready? Let's go. That's not how he speaks. That's what happened, but it was because every step was obeyed. Go out to the road. Done. Okay. Now you obeyed what I said. Go up to the carriage. Done. Okay. Now baptize him. Okay. Now I'm going to translate you. Oh, okay. One step at a time. Don't you think Peter would have liked a little bit more information before he walked on water? He's in the boat. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Come. Uh, huh? Anything else? I've always drowned in water. <laughs> I'm about to try to walk on something of drowning. Can you tell me? I mean, there's waves out here. There's an ocean. There's a lot of storms and stuff. You're not going to tell me anything else? No. He didn't step out on the water. He stepped out on a word. He stepped out on come come God is telling you all right now in this building he's giving you a step your obedience to that step determines whether your life progresses or whether you stay parked that step should be the most important thing in your life wow purpose is unfolded over time one obedience step after another it's not discovered all at once and here's the last thing I want to say to you about the Holy Ghost and then we're going to let him touch you Number four, he's always going to lead you by peace. He never pushes you. He never rushes you. Colossians 3.15, let peace, the peace of Christ, be the umpire continually, deciding and settling with finality all the questions that arise in your mind. You see, the umpire, if you know baseball, the umpire is the one who calls the shots. It, it doesn't matter if you think it's a strike or not. If he calls a strike, it's a strike doesn't matter if you think you're out or not if he calls it's out you're out if you want to argue with him he'll just throw you out of the game that's what God says peace should be like in our lives if you don't have peace that's an answer if you do have peace that's an answer but we go we don't have peace and we get into relationships all the time without peace we move forward without peace we negotiate with our peace we try to make deals with our peace but God said peace should have been the one that decided. Do you have peace? There's an answer. Do you not have peace? That's an answer. He'll never push you. You see, the devil is the one who wants you to make a decision in a rush. Don't ever make a decision in a rush. It's the devil that causes you to try to get overworked and, oh man, and what are we going to do with this? And what are we going to do with that? He gets you all riled up, but the Holy Spirit... He calms you down. He brings peace. 
It's the devil that says he's pushing you to do it, pushing you to get in that relationship, pushing you to get out, pushing you to make this decision, pushing you to do that. But the Holy Ghost, he brings peace. Never make a decision in a rush. Never make a decision out of pressure. And never trust a decision you make when you're in a place of fear. You're not logical when you're in fear. There's nothing about the decision you're going to make if you're in a place of fear about your kids. Don't make a decision out of fear. You're afraid for them, I understand, but you need to give that to the Holy Ghost. You don't need to try to preach at them all day long and try to correct them. They're not going to listen to you. You're in fear. You're trying to control your husband or your wife. You're in fear. That's why you're acting that way. Because when you get in fear, you feel you have to have control. You feel you have to change things, but that's fear. Don't move out of fear. Don't trust yourself when you're in a place of fear. Give your fear over to God. For he said, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but I've given you a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. He's leading you by peace. You see, one of the greatest things I can tell you is great advice. Is take a pause. I'm writing a book right now. It's called Pause. I don't know when it's going to be out. But I've seen the results and the power of a pause in every area of my life, and it's only helped. You got to pause before you yell at your kids. Just pause. Let the Holy Ghost calm you down. You got to pause before you have that conversation with your husband or wife. That's a tough subject. You better pause. You got to pause before you make that big decision about your house and your job. You better pause and ask the Holy Ghost. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. He'll direct your path. You see, some of us, we have to change your expectations because you know what God is asking? He's asking the same thing he asked his disciples. Who do men say that I am? Well, Lord, some of them say you're this and you're, you're this prophet and you're that. And then he says, you know what? I only ask that question because I want to know one thing. Who do you say that I am? Why? Because your expectations form your reality. Your expectations make your reality. If you come to this church and you expect this to just be, uh, okay, I promise it will be, uh, okay. If you come to this church expecting to hear from God, you will hear from God. If you come to this church, if you approach God hoping he listens to you, you're not going to probably get his presence. But if you obey the word, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You expect he's going to show up to prayer. You expect he's going to speak to you. He tends to speak to you. Your expectation is forming your reality. See, if they would have believed he was just a carpenter, the best he could have given them was a chair. Because all he could give them was what they saw him as. If he was just a carpenter, he gives them a table and chair. If he's just a prophet, he can tell them a little bit about the, the future. But Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, Peter, you're blessed because man has not told you this. It's been revealed from my father in heaven. He says, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, many people think it means on Peter. Yes, Peter was one of the first leaders, but you got to understand it's the process of what just happened. It's you hearing from God for yourself. You didn't hear this from man. You heard it from my father. That is a powerful rock. If you'll hear God for yourself, not just through a preacher. If you hear God for yourself, not just through a DG leader. If you hear God for yourself, not just for your sister or your mama. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you unshakable. Because if I say it to you, you might think it's cool for a little while, but you'll probably forget. But if God gives you a word, it will never leave you. It will never let shake. You can't shake it off of you. If God gives you a word about your kids, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It's unshakable. You got a word. The Holy Ghost wants to lead today. Every eye closed. Every eye closed, nobody's moving. I have two calls today. Two calls. Number one, do you know Jesus? You see, the intro to the kingdom is you got to know the man. If you don't have peace with God, I want to tell you something. You can't buy it. There's nothing you're going to be able to do to get peace with God. You can't get enough relationships for it. 
you're not going to have enough money to buy peace. You see, because God created you, the Bible says he put eternity in your heart. He put something in you that cries out for him. He created you to run on God. Just like a car runs on gas, you run on God. There's nothing else that will satisfy you. Do you know Jesus? Are you going to finally fix and fill that place in your life that feels empty? If you say, I want to know him and I don't know him, this is the first call. I'm going to have another one. Nobody moving right now. I want you to lift your hand up in one, two, three. I want peace with God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, lift it up boldly. I see you. I see you. Nobody's looking around. I see you. 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 God sees your hands all over this building. Now listen, I want you to do something else. I want you to stand up right now where you're at. If you lifted your hand, stand up right now. Don't stop right now. Keep your hand in the air. Stand up. Stand up between you and God. Nobody else is looking around right now. This is a sacred moment. Just stand up between you and God. You're not doing this for us anyway. You're doing it for the Lord. This is between you and the Lord. This is not about us. This is about God. You want peace with God. Come on, don't wait. I feel, I feel it tugging on my heart. There are more people that right now God is knocking on your door. Do not let this chance pass by. You have no idea what's going to happen today, tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen in your life. Thank you. Thank you. God said, if you'll not be ashamed of me in front of people, I won't be ashamed of you in front of heaven, in front of my Father. Now, with you are raising your hands right now, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to talk with you. All I want you to do is walk down here right now and get with one of these prayer leaders. Right now, walk. walk. Come on. Come on. Come on. Walk. Give them a hand as they're coming. Don't wait. You've already stood up. You might as well come down. I'm not going to ask you questions. You might as well come down. You've already stood up. Come on. Make that last walk. Nobody else is moving. We have one more call. Come on, make that last small. Come on. Look at all these people. Give them a hand like it's your sister, like it's your brother. Come on. Come on, altar team. We got people over here for you. We got people back here. Come on, altar team. Let's organize them. Right here behind. Wow, look at these people still coming up. They're coming all the way from. Come on, come on, come on. We got some workers over here as well, right over here. Look at these people responding to Jesus. Responding to Jesus. I'm going to tell you something very quick and then I'm going to let them pray with you. Every person who's up here, number one, every sin that you've ever had is about to be forgiven. Now here's the deal. God says he promises all won't ever remember them. So you don't have to remind them of them either. From this day forward, you got to let yourself go. And this is the hard thing. You're going to have to forgive yourself. You need to forgive yourself right now. If you don't forgive yourself, you can't move forward. God's going to help you. So I want you to know that God will not remind you of things that have happened. He washes your sins, kids, from the east and from the west. By his blood, they'll cleanse you right now. But you got to forgive yourself. you got to give yourself over to God and say, I forgive myself so I can move forward. Right now, as they have a hand on your shoulder, maybe they're taking your hands, whatever altar workers, make sure you engage with them. We're going to pray this prayer out loud, and then they're going to pray with you. Right after I pray, they're going to pray for you to give you the strength to forgive yourself. But let's all pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you, God, for your blood that's cleansed me of my sin. I receive your sacrifice. I am no longer the boss of my own life. You are the boss. I give you ownership. Take control. Teach me to be a disciple. Teach me to be a disciple. I need your help. Thank you that you died on a cross and that you rose again for this moment. I will never go back to my old life. That is done. Lead me. I need your Holy Spirit to guide me. I'm no longer going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, every person out there, listen to me right now. I want you, as they continue to pray with them up here, I want you right now. If you say, Gavin, you know what? I need to surrender to the Holy Ghost. You might be saved, but you've taken control of your family in your own hands. You've taken control of your business and your finances in your own hands. I'm asking for a renewed surrender. A renewed surrender. If you say, that's me. You know what? I've been acting like the boss, but I need the Holy Spirit to be that. I want you to stand up right where you're at right now. Stand up and put your hands in the air.
If you're willing and humble enough to say, I need his help, I'm re-surrendering. Put your hands up in the air right now, every person. The Holy Spirit's going to touch you right now. I'm going to pray for you a special prayer. Come on, y'all. This is being led. You have to surrender. He's not going to take it from you. He waits for you to willingly give it. Have you had your own opinions? Are you willing to give those over and he can change your mind? Maybe you're saying, you know what, Lord? Maybe he's been asking you for prayer time. Maybe he's been asking you for dedication to his word. You're surrendering that right now to the Lord. If you're standing, close your eyes and begin to ask him for help. Begin to ask for the guide, the precious Holy Spirit, to help you. You see, he's not expecting you to do this on your own. He can give you strength. He's not expecting you to figure this out on your own. He can give you strength. He's going to help you. Ask him, say, Holy Spirit, I need your help. Holy Spirit, I need your help. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need your help with this marriage, Lord. I think it's over. But God, I'm just trusting you. I need your help. I need your help, God, with my own life, my own mindset, Lord. I've been discouraged for so long. God, I need your help. God, I want to please you. I know I've been failing, but Lord, I thank you, God. You're calling me right now. I need your help. I'm praying for a touch of the Holy Spirit right now for you. Surrender your children to God right now. Say their names to the Lord. Say their names to the Lord. Come on, surrender your grandchildren to the Lord. Say their names to the Lord. Your husband or your wife, say their name. Surrender them to God. That's a son of God. That's a daughter of God. Precious Jesus, precious Jesus, this is a moment of decision. God is watching you right now. He sees what you're offering. Many of you are standing because you want to be used by God like you've never been used before. You're doing the right thing. But he's going to ask for more surrender. He's not going to ask for more things from you. He's not going to ask for you to perform better. He's not going to ask for your ideas. He just wants your surrender. you got to get his ideas. You're going to submit yourself to God. You're going to get on your knees and pray. You're not going to move forward until you hear from the Lord. You're not going to move forward until you hear from God. Don't move forward until you hear from God. Come on. Now I want you to ask the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me. Now just talk to him right now. You can pray in your language right now. If you have a prayer language, if you don't, pray in English. Say, Lord, Holy Spirit, I need your help right now. I thank you. I'd hand this over. I hand this over. I hand this over. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, let's get intimate with the Holy Spirit. Pray in your prayer language right now. Come on. Come on. You're handing yourself over. Let him cleanse your mouth. As you begin to pray, God is going to touch your mouth with a hot coal. Some of you are getting delivered from lying right now. You have a lying spirit. God is taking it out of your mouth right now. Come on. Let him touch your mouth with a hot coal. Surrender that mouth. Some of you are gossipers. This will be the last day you gossip. You're not going to be involved in that anymore. You're not going to waste your time. Some of y'all have just been, you, you've been, you exaggerate. You constantly exaggerate. Let God touch you. Touch our mouths, touch our mouths, touch our mouths, God. Touch our mouths, Lord. Some of you have been bringing death to your marriage from your own words, but just give that to the Lord right now. Say, God, I want to build this marriage. I got to bring life. I need help with my mouth, Lord. I need help. Some of y'all have big decisions to make right now financially, and you do not have direction you got to surrender your finances to God. I promise he'll give you an instruction. I promise he'll talk to you about something. Are you obeying what the word says? He's going to remind you of it. He's going to remind you when you obey, you'll get the blessing. When you obey, you get the blessing. He's going to lead you to the place you need to go. He's going to lead you to the command. He's going to lead you to the word that's inside. You obey it, you get the blessing. Thank you, Jesus, for strength to obey. Thank you, Jesus, for strength to obey. Thank you, Jesus, for strength to obey. Here's a promise for every person under the sound of my voice, Philippians 2.13. It is God who is working in you, causing you to desire and to do what pleases him. Some of you have desire, but you have not had follow through. You have desire, but you don't have follow through. Receive it from God right now. He'll give you the power to follow through. 
Don't focus on anybody else. Focus on God right now. He'll give you the power to follow through. Thank you, Lord. Come on, thank him that he's doing it. We don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. We don't ask by feelings. We ask by faith. If this is what the word says, you can have it. If this is what the word says, you can have direction because the word says you can. If you can have healing, you can have it. If you can have the promise, you can have it. You in it direction, clarity, you can have it. Oh, God Almighty, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see children being offered up to God. I see this atmosphere is full right now, full. I see babies' faces. I see grandchildren. I see families all up with God right now. Surrender, fresh surrender. He's going to teach you how to be the best parent you've ever known, the father, the mother you want to be. He'll teach you how to be the wife. you got to surrender. Stop trying to control. Let go. I want you to say right now, I let go of control. I let go of control. I let go of control. I got to hear your voice, Lord. You got to tell me what to do. I let go of control. A surrendered church is a dangerous church to the kingdom of hell. A surrendered church is a dangerous church to the kingdom of hell. Lord, I'm thanking you right now for every person that's praying this prayer. Everybody look at me. Put your hands out toward me. I'm dismissing you with this promise. Wednesday, I think it's Pastor Marco's coming back, but let me give you this promise right now. Be here on Wednesday. Make sure you're always in the house of God. Philippians 2.13. I'm going to say it again. You got to receive this. It is God who is working within you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit? Say yes. Do you receive the leading of the guide called the Holy Spirit? Say yes. Listen, you might need to listen to this word again and again and again. Because remember, whether you hear well done, good and faithful servant is whether you are led by the Holy Ghost. I love you all. Thank you so much, church. We bless you. Have a great day. Hope it's been a powerful word. Thank you, Jesus.